welcome everybody to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report, a special edition Nerd Gen Report. It's unlike the other reports where we give you, all, you know, all the news that's going on in the superhero film genre and TV genre. This is the Zack Snyder Justice League Special Edition Nerd Gen Report. Nothing else mattered. Whatever news that came out that week, nothing else matters. This was it. This was the movie that for several years people have been clamoring for, demanding. It was nonstop, and we finally got it. Zack Snyder Justice League. And then we're going to get into our award ceremony that we've been uh, promising for the past couple of weeks. Uh, that's going to be fun. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Go Brian, you saw it. I saw it. Let's talk about this. What a week. I mean, the build up, it, it felt really cool. It was an event. Whatever else, whatever you came out of it thinking, yeah. I have to say that I was caught up in the build up oh, yeah. to when this was released. I watched kind of the online red carpet premiere that Kevin Smith hosted. Like, I really kind of got into it. And so I mm -hmm. give a lot of credit to Zach for creating, you know, in an era where it's hard to get everyone focused on a single oh, yeah. event. Yeah. I felt very locked in. And as you know, and we know there was other stuff going on. Falcon yeah. Winter Soldier premiered this week, other stuff that we will talk about. But yeah. This really felt like a big deal. And it was very exciting to be a part of. So I'm, and I think whatever else we say tonight, I'm glad it exists. Yes. I think that's my number one. I am glad this exists in a final edited form and that yes. we did get to see it. Yeah. I think no regrets that they greenlit this oh, and yeah. ultimately that it came to be a reality. Yeah. Uh, the journey that um, to this point in time to get this movie released is going to be something talked about for years to come. And I thought it wasn't going to happen. And then a few things started happening with HBO Max. And, you know, we found, finally got a window for the for for it to possibly happen. And it did. And we were, I, you know, I was counting down the, the days for this movie to be released and it's been released. I saw it 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry, 10 o'clock at night. All the way up to what time? Four hours, whatever, two, three yeah. o'clock in the morning. I, I saw it. I wasn't, you know, giving the slow, I wasn't falling asleep. I was there watching this film and I'm glad I saw it. Uh, but let's get into it. So my overall take, this was better than I expected. I, I think, you know, if original theatrical Justice League, which you know was almost unilaterally panned, if that was for me a one and a half star type of movie on a scale of four, I think Zach got this pretty close to like a three star effort in my book. He got a lot closer to making this memorable and the highs were pretty high in this. I think it wasn't perfect. Some of the narrative issues and decisions that were intact throughout his Snyderverse, I think still played a role in this and we'll talk about those. But I had off. I think he got a lot closer to delivering something that was really exciting and pretty cool than I thought was possible. So yeah, I, I kind of give it three stars. I do think there is probably a two and a half to two hour, 40 minute version of this that would have been maybe just as good, if not a little tighter while preserving his vision and not bringing in the studio interference. Yes. And I do have strong regrets that the studio did not allow that to happen because there's some real key moments in this film where I kind of found myself saying, man, I actually would have been fun. Yeah. And I do think that would have been extra cool. But all in all, I gotta admit, better than I expected. And I've watched it and I've gone back to select parts since then and watched them again. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a few sequences in here that I will be pulling up repeatedly, which is more than I could have said for some of the other parts of the right. DC universe. So for me, it's three stars. And you know, like I said, pleasantly surprised by what we got overall. Uh, in the, the first 
um, iteration of this uh, for me was probably, I would say, I'd give it a one and a half, right? And we all knew that this movie was going to be better. There was no doubt about it. And it was. For me, I'm glad there were certain scenes that weren't in that film that were atrocious, I think, in the first film. Um, I'm glad those weren't in there. And I agree with you. This movie is about, for me, if they were editing, I don't know, we need this, in two, we need a two and a half, three hour film, tops. You have, there's a lot of wasted scenes or scenes that didn't really belong there. And, you know, I found myself like, what the hell is this? Yeah. But nonetheless, I'm not going to give it as high a score that you, that, that you just gave it, a three star. I'm not going to go that far. I'm going to go with two and a half. Okay. We're going to go down the middle, sort of. Um, it was definitely an improvement. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm glad I watched it. Uh, so yeah, two, two and a half stars for me on this uh, release, the Zack, the Zack Snyder Cut release of two and a half stars. Is there a single scene that the studio slash Josh Whedon added that you would trade for what's in this version? No. For me, there's not a single moment. Because no. it was very clear as we went through, obviously, we got to finally pull the curtain back on what was a Joss scene and what was a Zach scene. Yeah. There, at the end of this movie, I said there wasn't a single scene that wasn't a, that they replaced, added, that yeah. I felt was an improvement in yeah. any way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't, I, like, I'll never watch the Josh Whedon's movie again. And that's not to say that every scene in this was perfect. It's just no, simply to not. say that everything they did to it made it worse. Everything. Yeah. That's yeah. impressive on a whole yeah. other level. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, so you want to get into or discuss each part of this film? All right. Yeah, let's rip through the film and then we'll get to our Snyder Cut Oscars at the, at the end of this. So here's my opening question for you because we really get hit with the, and a lot of this is gonna be comparative because yeah. so many of us have seen uh, the, the theatrical version. Yeah. What were your thoughts on a totally different opening setup, right? This idea of Superman's death and the cry of him dying, going out through the universe as setting kind of everything in motion here. What do you think about that versus kind of just jumping into the story, which is effectively what the, the theatrical version did? I was, to, for me, honestly speaking, I was like, okay, this is the reason, like really this was the reason? His yelling caused shock waves that caused the mother boxes to be afraid and to awaken. I guess there's no other explanation, really, right? But I, I thought it was, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't buy it. That's my, my follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. Now, to your point, it's really the only way to make the MacGuffin work. So I did accept it on the level of, okay, you're using this as yeah. a tool to widen the universe. So I. It's a stretch maybe, but I, yeah. I get where you go. Here's my question, and it's one of the struggles I have with this whole Snyderverse arc. Was Superman at the top of his game long enough to command that kind of intergalactic fear and respect? That, because to, to me, he defeats Zod in his effectively first appearance to the world. So presumably that would get filtered to the other worlds and aliens. Mm -hmm. But this was treated like the decades long defender of Earth had just gone down. And in this universe, he was really kind of new when he got killed. So exactly. that was the part for me that felt a little bit inconsistent. It was like, they were treating this like, oh, that guy's Earth is now totally defenseless. So I'm like, but how would they have known he was around for like a couple months? Exactly. I, I agree with you 100%. They made it seem like 
this what this is the argument that I've always made with, with the Superman of this universe. They made him far too important too quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he arrives. Everybody's sort of scared of him. Then in the next film, he rescues Lois Lane and let everybody else dies. You know, and then the destruction of, you know, that uh, the fight that he had with Zod was just, you know, thousands of people perished. Right? It's like, how do you root for a guy, right? Like, like, like that sort of. I don't know. It just, I didn't feel anything for him dying, you know? Yeah, and it felt like in, you know, they sort of address this in Batman vs Superman because they show the montage of him becoming this godlike figure with all these rescues and saves. But let's yeah. be honest, in the context of this fight, all of that is irrelevant. That's small yeah. time, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is where it felt like to me, BVS did him a disservice by not giving him, it felt like there was another movie in there. That's what I mean. It felt like there was a sequel that needed to happen where he needed to defeat someone else intergalactic, whether it was Brainiac or whoever, to kind of build his reputation as this unstoppable defender of Earth. Yeah. And that felt a little missing here to me when it suddenly became like, oh, now Steppenwolf's coming and Darkseid's coming. They all feel like Earth is vulnerable. Why, why do they care? Like he's, you know, yeah, he's Kryptonian, but like he's only been in the game for a little bit and he died right away. So they, why would they think he was that great then? The, the so. monuments, the, the the memorials to a person that just revealed himself. Right. I would say there's a span of five years. Five years isn't enough, regardless. And, and you, again, I, I have to go back to it. Thousands of people perished from that fight with Zod. Right. So you understand uh, the dude that lost his legs, the hatred that he had towards it. He's, uh, you can't say that he's the only one that felt this way, right? And for him to, for him to get a memorial and, and I mean, it didn't, it doesn't make sense for me. So I really didn't care for it. But I mean, they use that, that vehicle, that scream in order to, to, to I guess, start uh the start towards that path of how all this um um starts off so so that was the prologue if you will and at least it does introduce the mother it certainly introduced the mother boxes better than what we got in the theater which was which was that parademon with the images of him after he kind of exploded yeah. which made nothing that made no sense all right so at least <laughs> we have a okay so part one for the highlight for me battle with the amazons that yeah. was, it's interesting because it was in the theatrical version, but the changes that were made underscore to me something Zach, there's two things Zach is really great at. One is action pacing. Yeah. There was something about the way Hippolyta was jumping around, the stakes of the Amazon sacrificing themselves. This battle was much cooler. This time. Yes. yes. I have to say, I love 300. There is something about these. I was thinking about that when I was watching. Zach is badass at these and i'm like i came out of this scene i was like patty jenkins if you want to bring zach back in some have him direct the amazon series yes because then it would be good i'm yeah. telling you it'll be good because he does this era really well so yeah. for me it was really eye-opening i i really love this scene there's a you know, specific character i mentioned hippolyta we'll talk about her later but it was an eye-opening start it got me it got me a little bit more excited than i expected to be so that was my kind of highlight of this this first part. I don't know what stood out, what else stood out to you in kind of the early first 30, 40 minutes. Um, I believe in the first, um, um, in part one, we got, didn't we get, uh, or was that, I'm sorry if I'm jumping, the age of heroes when Wonder Woman shows up. Which part did Wonder uh, no, Woman? Wonder Woman, the intro sequence, the reshot intro sequence is in part one. Yes. Okay. For me, that was the best scene. Wonder Woman doing her thing and doing and blocking all those bullets and going, that was, yo, that was, that was amazing. That was amazing. That was amazing to me. That's the thing that sticks out in my head every time I think about that movie. And I will say again, that was a scene I actually went back and watched the Whedon version 
because I had this feeling when I was watching it, like, why did the Wonder Woman effects feel much better in mm -hmm. this version? Mm -hmm. And th the timing is a little different. Like, if you watch her in her version of Super Speed in this version, it's just more fluid. She's yeah. moving in a way where you more believe she can stop this. No, oh, by the way, I'm so glad they showed her kicking there. So I actually <laughs> love seeing those guys getting thrown against the wall. I was like, I know that the, maybe that wouldn't have worked for PG-13, but yeah. great call. And I, I'm with you. Like it was, again, it was, a scene where it was like 80% of it was in the theatrical version, but it shot this way 10 times cool. Oh, oh yeah. He, she kind of can fly in this. So he kind of did honor Wonder Woman 84. Yeah. Not quite a fly, but she does jump up in a way that looks yeah. like she can fly. Yeah, so I don't know exactly. if he fixed that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. That was highlight number two. But overall, part one, um, I think was 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 really well done. I, I was it the one thing part of it I didn't like too much. And I and I'm pretty sure it was a scene that if you wanted to cut it, if I, if Zach told me which part would you I would cut this part, would be um when aquaman goes into the water and they start singing i'm yes. like what is this all about can i get an explanation and there was nothing it was just people singing it was so just, you hit on oh, it was i bad. agree with you it was jarring it was weird yeah. <laughs> but i think it, you know what it is i think it's it is zach snyder's thematic view that these heroes are gods among mortals. And so you see this throughout this film and you saw it in BVS, you saw it in Man of Steel with Superman doing the Christ pose in front of the sun. That is his worldview. And whether you, you have to buy in or you don't buy in, I yeah. personally thought this was forced and weird. Yeah. But I think that's what he was trying to illustrate to you was that like Aquaman to these people is their God. Yeah, and, you know, and that's what you're seeing. And they bring the other into one. Song. I would just flag is like, you know, nice to see, and they did carry it through. Was the establishment of Alfred in part one as mm -hmm. a much more relevant part of Bruce Wayne's life, and you oh, start yeah. to get a hint of like what he does for him. It was one of one of my sort of underrated favorite parts of this film. Is like, oh, Alfred has a real job, and it is a little different than the job we've typically seen Alfred get. So I like that they started started down that path in part one. So all right, I, we have the same high points and the same low point. The, the singing was the low point. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was. <laughs> and the, but the two action pieces were were both excellent. Yeah, I, I, I definitely like that part too. The the because it shows Steppenwolf. You know, he looked great. I think I think he definitely looked much better. Um, and Steppenwolf in this film, I don't want to get too deep into it because I know we're just going over part one. He, I, I think he was, for me anyway, I received him much more um, as a threat and a more uh, a, ca a character that needed to prove himself to obviously dark side and all that. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't as horrible as it was in the first one. <laughs> we'll get into Stephen Wolf in a yes, bit, but yes. I agree with you. So that was part, part two for me, the, the, the three things I'll throw out to you and feel free if anything that you jogs your memory. So number one is the the reason why people made the Lord of the Rings analogy is because this battle between Darkseid and the heroes of Earth is pretty much note for note Sauron against the elves, the dwarves, yeah, and men yeah. from, from the start of Fellowship of the Ring. So that was a real highlight. Again, I thought this was actually a really, really well done scene with a couple of really interesting cameos and highlights we'll get into later. We also have the clear teeing up of the Aquaman solo film with Volko, who was completely cut from the theatrical version, shows up in a fairly impactful scene here because he delivers in the equipment. So if you ever wondered where he got the equipment from, that, that's where it came yeah. from. And then the third one, which, you know, in the category of things, I don't understand how they cut, the Wonder Woman backstory of how she actually knows what's going on. They gave you the arrow leading to the crypt where she sees the timeline and the history. I'm like, Oh, that's how she actually can explain this as opposed to the theatrical version. It's like, what the hell? She just knows all this off the top yeah. of her head? Like, all right, yeah. an essential piece for me that that was cut and it was nice to see added back. Those were kind of the three highlights. The low light for me, similar to the singing, the build up to shooting the arrow, a little long for me. I like, was yeah. like the Amazons did well in part one Again, it felt like this godlike thesis that he was going with didn't need as big of a ceremony there. It was part, probably the, the low point. But part two still for me was a pretty good part with that big battle 
and then sort of the Wonder Woman kind of detective work going on. I don't know, what, did, what, what stood out to you in that, that piece? Um, what st stands out to me, and again, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the t the moment when Darkseid side strikes the ground, isn't it similar to Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf discovering the anti-life equation? It's identical. Did why did Darkseid not know that in you know that to be the case? That was I was confused about that. He was there. He knows it's not like they beat him up so bad that he forgot about it. So he, I, to me, he like discovered it. And Steppenwolf tells him always oh, on Earth, but I thought he already knew that. Anyway, I thought that battle scene was dope. Um, uh, Hercules, I'm mean, not Hercules. Zeus. You, you, Zeus. <laughs> we should talk about Zeus at some point. This dude was huge. <laughs> I went and looked well, it up. Sergey Sergey Constance, a bodybuilder, a model, not really an actor, but I was like, I know he didn't get to do much, but he's got some presence. There's yeah. something there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's definitely something there. Again, and I, I we I did a show a long, long time ago with uh, about her uh, uh, Marvel doing a show about Hercules. They need to look into hiring these bigger guys for roles like that because it'll be more believable especially if it's somebody like hercules but the i thought one i thought it was if you were gonna go for, i mean i know they're trying it but live action he-man that was the best candidate physically that i've seen for that role in a long time yeah i mean i don't know how you make he-man no, good I know. <laughs> I but know. if they ever did it that's what they need to we it gotta look like he-man it can't be anything else but that fight scene was definitely uh I didn't see any didn't seem any different to me than the original film. I just uh, say the graphic violence, like the Green Lantern being killed, I think was, you know, yeah. to be pretty dramatic. And and he, he tries to get the ring and then and then can't, but yeah. But it was similar to the only thing, the only difference between this and the other one is that Dark Side is there and that's the Yes. Yes. That's for me, that's the only difference. But I did like the fact that, you know, with the arrow thing and, and her discovering and her understanding what's coming uh, did did, uh, uh, did make sense to the overall story. And, 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 it, and it was, you know, it was something that should have been kept. I don't understand why they cut that. No, uh, yeah, st I mean, stunning decision. Um, not the most stunning, we'll get to that in a bit, yeah. but on, on the top five of like, how could you make this movie without having that scene in there? Exactly. So for me, now I just look before we get into part three and four, these, let's call it the prologue part one and two, felt like they were moving really quickly. I, I, th these yeah. parts went by quickly. I was like, oh, we're, we're really moving along. Mm -hmm. It then starts to slow. For me, three and four is where this movie started to get a little bogged down and cluttered. So in mm -hmm. three, we get the intro story for Barry Allen, Victor Stone. We also get, I think, one of the great what if moments in this movie, which is the conversation between Steppenwolf and Desaad, where you get clued in a little bit to what's going on with Steppenwolf. Mm -hmm. What did you think about, I'm gonna let you cook on this and then I'll, I'll wait. What did you think about the, the Barry Allen intro versus kind of the Victor Stone intro in, in this part? The Barry Allen intro, I could have done without the job interview and him saving Iris. It meant nothing. Thank you. Towards the story, it meant. I want to hear if you'd nothing. say it. Hundred percent with you. I mean, like it meant, it meant nothing. You definitely get at get that out of there there's there's, there's no reason for it to be there especially other than other than he, uh, coming I, uh, what i was like especially no like so especially knowing there's a flash film standalone coming all of that belongs in that movie exactly doesn't belong here yeah exactly it, it it didn't belong in in that in that in this film so to me i was like you know, I really didn't enjoy it. And you know, I don't, I'm not really 
too into uh, Ezra Miller's version of uh, of this character, although he was much more um, acceptable in certain parts, but then there was much more corny parts. Yeah. But again, that part did not belong there. Victor Stones, however, for me, was one of the best parts of this film. And I don't know if this is part four, where it, he where Joe Morton talks about his his abilities. It's three going into four. Like, yeah, it's it's kind of three is sort okay. of where because he's remember he's standing in the window, he sees the football on the street, and then he Got does it. the flashback, but then um soon after that joe morton's character his dad comes in with the tape recorder and got it start to, yeah so that part was amazing to me that's one of the parts i could probably go back and watch i think it was so well done in explaining his abilities uh, i think it was one of the more like in terms of other superhero films and explaining their powers and their abilities mm -hmm. and what they're able to do this was one of the best so i completely agree with you I was this scene where his intro scene was one of the biggest surprises to me. And we were expecting Ray Fisher to do well in this movie. But what surprised me was Zack Snyder's portrayal of this was pretty emotional, poignant. I thought he was on point. It really established the motivations of his dad as to why his dad would do what he did with the mother box. This is a moment where I felt like Zack's storytelling was there. Like he delivered in a way we didn't have to do with the action it wasn't about the visuals it was about the emotional content of the character and he got it and i was yeah, very yeah. impressed yeah. and i will say pablo i had no idea how you could look at this material and have be under orders to cut this down to two oh. hours and say that this has was going go. on the cutting room floor so yeah. the, i gotta put this out there it yeah. smells man it's yeah. oh. it, it like everything we've heard that came out with the claims and the back and forth, I saw this and I was like, man, <laughs> there might be something else going on because this is one of the best parts of the movie. So if you're cutting this out, you're cutting out because you have a you have a, an ax to grind. And that's disappointing. Listen, before we started the show, I was thinking about, I was just going through my head about what we we're going to talk about. And this was one of the things I was talking about. If there was an issue, if there was this bad blood between Ray Fisher and Josh Whedon and everyone else involved in this film, which, which uh, Ray Fisher had an issue with, they cut that because of him or that problem that they were having. That's the only explanation, because you cannot, in your right mind, if you're a movie goer and like movies and like good stuff, watching that, you cannot say to me, cut that. I'll be like, no, absolutely not. The movie doesn't work without it at all his character it doesn't like we got to the end of this it, this movie does not work without victor stone being a fully realized character if and anyone it, with an iq above 50 would have realized <laughs> watching the material so i just yeah i, I it, mean the, maybe suspicious man oh yeah i mean it, it, it's guilty this is guilty they, they they did it because of whatever rift they had doing this doing this film and you so, wonder I'm, opening credits i don't know if it's a coincidence but the directed by zach snyder graphic pulls up when we see ray fisher for the first time i don't know if that's a coincidence or if that's <laughs> meant as sort of like a little solidarity gesture of in my world in my version your character means something but yeah when when they were saying when Zach said that Victor Stone is the heart of the film, you, it's, it's absolutely one hundred percent correct. You know, so yeah, that's what I thought about that 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 intro to Victor Stone. I thought it was one of the best parts of the film. Now let me let me propose an idea. So I know we, we when we criticize things, we want them taken out easy for people to say, "Hey, that's easy for you to do." All right, I'm going to propose a trade for you. We take the Barry Allen, Iris West entire sequence. That probably was 10 minutes at least. With the slow-mos and stuff. There's a lot of slow-mos in this. It was long. 
Yeah. And, and by the way, I would also say that I think what Zach was going for would be one to show you how Barry perceives the world within the speed force. And number two, to drive home this point if he's kind of a misfit, right? He doesn't really have his life together. Mm -hmm. I would argue to Zach, we got that message from the conversation with his dad in the prison. We didn't need to actually see it visualized. Yeah. And I think it would have been cooler to see the speed force for the first time in action, which is in the first battle against Stephen, which is yeah. ironic, which is coincidentally when Batman first puts on a suit in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I propose we take that segment out. I would have given anything for them to take the conversation between Steppenwolf and Desaad and give us Steppenwolf's flashback to his history with Darkseid. If they had given us 10 minutes to show us the betrayal, to show us what happened and sneak in a little bit of intro to the anti-life equation, I think this movie actually levels up. Yeah, I agree. I got so close when that conversation, my ears were like, oh, oh yeah. And Definitely. then when they didn't go down that path any further, um, it just left me feeling like what a missed opportunity. I was like, Zach, you knew it. You wrote it in there. It's <laughs> in there for you to play with. And yeah, yeah. he didn't shoot it. And yeah. I, I just, I would make that trade in a heartbeat. And I think this, that part three would be a lot stronger to me because it did feel like it started to drag at points. Oh parts. yeah, definitely. But it, it, it goes to show uh, in conversations that we've had in, in previous shows, it's the storytelling that Zach has a problem with. And yeah. I'm not just, I'm not here to say that I'm an expert in all this stuff, but in terms of, you know, us watching movies and stuff, story is important. And if you can't make it flow, then people are going to feel a little bit weird and not really, I'm not going to say not enjoy it as much, but they're going to have issues with it. And this was definitely an issue where you had an opportunity to really give us some backstory. And instead you put in some scenes that really didn't mean anything to, for it, Yeah, you know, so. So we get into part four, which is where we see the heroes getting together and they kind of have their first fight with Steppenwolf. I gotta be honest, you know, it was cleaner than the original. We lost some of the awful Barry Allen, Diana stuff, thankfully, from this. But I will say that this is one of those where I felt like I wished I hadn't seen the theatrical version because a lot of it was the same. same and yeah. so I was like, eh, it lost some of its effect. And I think it would have been cooler if I had seen it this way the first time. So that was one part of part four. The second was, I did actually like the way the Justice League interacts and ultimately kind of all subconsciously centers on bringing Superman back to life versus the theatrical version where it's like Bruce kind of guilting them and ranting at them, being like, yeah, you yeah, gotta yeah, do yeah. this. And yeah, yeah. That, this felt a little more genuine of like all the characters being like, all right, we fought the bad guy. I'm not sure we can stop him by ourselves. We need help. And this is the big gun. And I, it felt it worked a little bit better. And I even thought Barry was better in this scene. I absolutely cool. agree because he was Barry Allen is not a dumb dude. No, they, they make him sound in the first film. They make him sound like he just doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He just has the speed. He just has his ability. Right. And I'm glad that they took out that part where he says, I've never done this before in terms of yes. saving people, Great. right? So in this, he's a little bit more serious and telling, you know, given his rationale that, you know, we gotta do, we gotta do this. And so I like that part. That's, this was a, this was the part that I felt like Barry Allen was a little bit more digestible for me, right? So yeah, I agree with you on that. Cause it was a natural progression towards that decision. Yes. It wasn't just Bruce pushing. And then you, I have to say this, that sequence in the first film where Bruce and Diana are going back and forth and she says something to like sort of hurt his feelings was poor, poor, poor in terms of acting. It was just, it was just whack. It, it made no whack. sense too, because yeah. she gets mad enough to hit him. Yeah. And then 10 seconds later, she's like, all right, <laughs> we're gonna bring him back we're good like it just it didn't it did it wasn't believable yeah it wasn't believable and this felt a lot more genuine she's like well I, I can think of one person strong enough to fight this guy like you know and so it felt like she's like i don't necessarily know if this is the right call but i get it like i yeah. buy into the logic you know so yeah. it felt a lot more cohesive and sensible now Part four, I don't want to, I don't want, let's save a little bit on this, but it does also include the long-awaited debut of one Martian Manhunter. 
does appear in this part for the first time. I, I want you to save some of what you have to say on this, but what I did want to ask you was, what did you think just about the idea of showing him for the first time in this way, in this moment, as a replacement for Martha Kent? I was just trying to understand what was the purpose behind all of it. Like, why, why, why go to the lowest lane to as Martha to find out what I'm, I'm still because people still haven't got, done their breakdowns of this film. People are still working on it because this is a long film and people are still breaking down. But that scene to me didn't make sense as to why he would do that. And you're still not show up for the whole joint, but go ahead. <laughs> David, David, I just, so the weird thing about this for me was he gave it away in the last trailer because that shot of Diane Lane with red eyes, I remember seeing that in the trailer being like, is that really? Asian Manhunter? There's a single shot in the last trailer of Diane Lane with the red eyes. And I'm like, well, Martian Manhunter has red eyes. And then that was, so that what I thought was a mistake. Yeah. Here's my issue with this scene. I think he made a very good decision to flesh out Martha Kent and Lois Lane's relationship in the aftermath of Superman's death. It made those characters more believable as the, the family or the surrounding characters to Clark. And I liked this scene because it kind of showed this give and take of, you know, yeah, of Martha Kent trying to inspire Lois to move on with her life. And, and I felt like when she walked out of the apartment and transformed, it cheapened the scene because it yes. kind of undermined that it wasn't really the relationship between those two people. It was him posing as her yeah. to motivate Lois Lane. So I actually would have preferred he just save it. Yeah. Or later in the movie, you're not included at all. And I, I, I was like, it was, it looked cool. Like, March, yeah. as usual, Zach knows how to portray. Like, that looked like Martian Manhunter when he was fully unveiled. Yeah. But man, I, I just felt like the human interaction piece of between Martha and Lois was done really well. And I wouldn't have messed with it. So that yeah. that's my issue. That, yeah, I, I was very really disappointed by that because you thought it was, you thought it was Martha Kent talking to Lois Lane and then having them that moment. Yeah. And it for it to be this guy, I wasn't listen. Let's move on from that. Because Mar Marsh I, I just that Martian Mar Manhunter reveal didn't make sense there. It didn't make sense there, but so we're into part five. They're they they made a decision to go get Superman. The graveyard scene, highs and lows. <laughs> truly awful humor comments from Barry Allen for me awful like, yeah. I, I was literally on my couch like I had my hands around my knees being like please tell me when this he stops talking this is awful. <laughs> on the flip side I will say this I thought there was a pretty neat exchange between Jason Momoa and Gal Gadot where they were kind of like, on the truck kind of talking about the similarities between Atlanteans and Amazons. I was like, wow. can we get a crossover? Can I, can I get a crossover? I would sign up to actually see those two do a little cross. So anyway, I thought that was actually kind of fun. Now, part five does also include, and we'll talk about it several times, right before they resurrect Superman, I guess it's Cyborg's version of the nightmare where he has the vision of the future with dark side in control. What was your reaction when that's when that montage kind of ripped through the screen and you finally saw dark side doing something for the first time, even if it was only a vision? <sighs> to me, I was thinking like, okay, how is he, you know, like, why is he thinking about this? I mean, he's a, uh, he knows everything digital computers and all this stuff. Why is he? seeing this what wh why is this a vision for him uh, sort of i was thinking about that i was like why is he i mean it was cool some of the shots that we see from that but how is this i just have problems with the visions in these films so i interpreted it as it was the kryptonian ship warning him because he was plugged in and remember it said this is not a good idea so I interpreted it as it was, we know the ship kind of thinks and it had sort of Kryptonian intelligence, whether it's Jarrell or whatever. I interpreted it as they were feeding that into his 
kind of network, and that's what you were seeing. That's what I guess I read that as. Possibly, but they don't, I mean, I, I don't believe they have that ability to see into the future and, you know. Yeah, well, they didn't explain how. Yeah. I, I, I was so just that's, trying to yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. assume that's what it was. But. Yeah, yeah. That it, it was, you know, it was like okay, it was dope. It was dope, but it didn't. Uh, I was like, why is he having these visions? Why, how, you know? Yeah. But your explanation makes sense. But still, how is the ship supposed to know? They're yeah. saying it's a bad idea. Yeah. But how is it? How are they feeding feeding him these visions? Is sort of yeah. my sort of uh, a question. That being said, this was a movie where I felt like Dark Side, just because of the way you know we knew we didn't get the sequel, so we knew we weren't going to get fully realized Dark Side. I was just thankful to see Dark Side do something because I was like, I didn't think we would get anything, and I was like, all right, even if it is imagined, I get yeah. to see him kicking there in like thirty <laughs> seconds. So yeah, I'll talk about yeah. that more later. But that was yeah. kind of fun. You do get then Superman against the Justice League. Now, first point again, connectivity. So Zach had established that Lois Lane goes to the monument every day. And so that actually made it feel like, all right, she might actually be there, as opposed to the theatrical version where it's like she felt like a prop. It's like, oh, yeah, drive yeah. her up, let her yeah, out, yeah. see what she can do. <laughs> so at least we had established she would be there. And yeah. this was, you know, you had some cooler effects and, and that sort of stuff in this. I don't know. I, I'm kind of I'm kind of both ways on this. Like, it's a cool look at points in this scene. I don't know if we needed as much of it as we got. It felt like there was an awful lot of conflict here, like over and over again. Yeah, I guess yeah. they're just trying to drive home how much stronger he is than the rest of the league when he's yeah. powered up. Right. And then I got to throw this in there because I know we're going to talk about it. Military man opening fire on Superman again. Come on. <laughs> like, how many effing times are you going to do this? And we know who's we know who's somewhere out there calling yeah. that shot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. Margin Man under green lighting these open fire on this guy. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it, again. Yeah. I'm, and then you, I'm, it goes back to him. Like, if he's the one calling the shots, how is he then motivating Lois? Like, what, I don't, I don't see the connection there. No. It doesn't make sense unless it's coming from somewhere else. And if so, who is that person calling the shots? If it's not Marshall Mantha, we, we gotta we gotta believe it's him, right? Because he's the one been in charge since the beginning. It's military vehicles in downtown of a major city. Like they're not rolling up on their own. There's a yeah. there's a high ranking military official somewhere who's like, yeah, you're you're cleared to fire with civilians in the area. Yeah, and fire on Superman for the umpteenth <laughs> time. Like. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, now you get the scenes at the farm. I, I will say these were clearly better, but I tell you, it, you know, if, if Henry Cavill is done as Superman after this movie, this group of writers just didn't know how to write for him. It, these lines were better, but they still just felt a little forced, and it was just clearly like they didn't quite know how to. He did what they asked him to do. I just didn't think they gave him a lot to chew on. And I don't know. It, it, it's one of my great frustrations. Um, it was an improvement, but it still felt a little bit empty when he kind of blasted off and then, you know, went to be Superman again. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I didn't care for that scene, um, that scene in the farm. Uh, was there anything, like, super different from the original? Well, in the in the theatrical, Lois is like, I like the way you smell. And he's like, and she's like, how's it like to be back? And he's like, itchy. Like, it's really awful. So at yeah, least in yeah. this one, you get the sense of like, Lois gives him the shirt. And he's kind of like, I love this place. Like, you know, I, I did like these sort of like reacquainting myself with things that I remember and these yeah. memories that I have. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it just felt, it just didn't feel like he would, he, that they had a clear vision for his personality. Um, he tended toward optimistic when he's like, look, I have a second chance. And then he still felt very stuck in the past. I don't know. It just, like I said, it, it felt like a writer problem, not a Cavill problem. To yeah. me. They just didn't crack it. Um, so then part six is the final battle, uh, yeah. which had a lot of changes. I got to admit, I was surprised at the amount that actually was different in terms of just what we didn't have stuck in this scene. And the colors. And the colors and the palette and the way it was shot. Yeah, just, it just you know, I'll, I'll let you cook on this. Like, what was your reaction? Just sort of the, the whole totality of the invasion, the invasion on Steppenwolf's face, 
and then kind of how they ultimately sort of solved it, solved the problem. It was much more watchable. Yeah. Um, even though there were a lot of stuff that was similar, although obviously, you know, the, 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 the dark side stuff was, was, was newer. Um, it was just, it was just much more watchable than the first one. And, you know, the display of Superman's power was certainly displayed wonderfully as well. Yeah. Uh, the chopping of the head was like, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, it, I, I enjoyed some of the action sequences better than obviously the first one because it just looked better. It didn't look weird. That family part oh of it, yeah. I, I was, you know, I was like, oh, where is that scene? Because <laughs> I, I mean, I was like, I was hoping that it wasn't Zach and Zach, you know, I, I guess either A, it was Josh that resh that shot that for some, yeah. whatever reason. And I don't understand why he made it. And I'm talking about Josh Whedon made that, made fear a, 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 a part of this film in terms of when it when it came to the parademons. And this was totally not there at all, which yeah. was which was cool. Um, the, whole, the whole setup was different. I, I really liked, I mean, the, the attack on the base made a lot more sense of like, yeah how Bruce was going to bring down the shield and then how they joined him in that kind of, we're going to drive a wedge basically through. And I will say this, I was shocked to find this out. Zach actually restrained him. There, there are fewer parademons on screen in this than there are in the theatrical version. Now, there definitely are a bunch kind of like a, like a pie, but he did restrain himself. There were fewer shots of like hundreds of parademons. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was much more focused and I, I did appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I again was left to your point about the family and then they also took out the thankfully the thing about like kind of flash racing superman where superman's pushing the building and yeah like, yeah, yeah yeah all that yeah. stuff was taken out. Gone, yeah. i don't understand how they reworked this scene without the speed force trick though that was sort of one of those things where i was like when i watched this scene end to end i'm like wow that really felt like a pretty central piece of this to cut out yeah and they they somehow did i agree with you 100 percent on superman i do think there was one little missed opportunity i don't really know how it would have solved it he beats up Steppenwolf pretty good, mm -hmm. but he doesn't kill him. He he uses the heat vision to shave off the horn, and you and the distinction is is unmistakable versus what he did to Zod. And I thought there might have been a little opportunity for some closure or something there to tie that off, and they just didn't go there. But anyway, I, I noticed it at least like he definitely was pulling back a little bit there. And then, like you said, the beheading, the end sequence was exactly what was rumored. That's what was rumored for years was the mm -hmm. end sequence, which was Diana chopping off his head. The head goes through the boom tube and dark side stops it. He sees the team and yeah. that's kind of where it sort of ends. And that it still looked cool, but I mean, it, it had been sort of spoiled a little bit. So yeah, overall, I thought the, I thought part, so if part one and two were probably my favorites to be quite honest, and then sort of the Victor Stone origin right up there, four is probably my least favorite it's pretty draggy mm -hmm. and then you know i thought the final battle was a, a big improvement like I, I don't know if it was you know i don't think it quite got to like for me you know, we talked about the best superhero fights like i don't think we quite got there you know in yeah, terms yeah. of anything with steppenwolf against the heroes but, yeah. but it was good like I, I definitely liked seeing what we got and i liked that when it was steppenwolf inside there were no parademons there as you know i'm a big thing about that and i like that so you know, I think overall a pretty satisfying kind of final battle with one exception that I will talk about later, which was more of a, a special effects thing that I just had an issue with, but. Um, okay, barring the the special effects, what did you think about, I mean, cause there were two instances where Flash used time mm -hmm. a reversal to get, to achieve a certain objective was when the boom, boom, um, the mother box was going to fall into the the liquid where uh, Clark was um, awaiting to get, I guess, reanimated, right? Right. He used his his speed force to sort of reverse that and then, I guess, touch it at the right time. Yep. And then at the end, to sort of reverse what happened um, and him being, you know, shot by that parent demon. I mean... I think, to be honest, they didn't really need all of that. They should have saved the speed for for something for I guess Flashpoint. 
right? Because that, because showing that in 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 when they were in um, Superman's um, um, ship shows that he can do it, right? But this one they showed that because we're gonna see pretty much the same thing a little bit to a, a, a bigger extent where he goes actually back in time in the Flash form. And here they used it, and I just think it's just gonna be like, okay, he's going back in time. Okay, so what? It's just that the effect of it is gonna be lost, I guess, in Flashpoint. And in this one, when he does it at the end, I I just felt they could have done without it. Interesting. I didn't mind it as much, although we will talk about it more in a different context later. The reason why I didn't mind it was I think they had already committed to the path in BVS when Ezra Miller pops up in Bruce Wayne's vision and he's like, Lois Lane, she's the key, too soon, too soon. So to me, I actually felt like this was the coloring of that palette to let you know that this is going to be, in the original Snyderverse, this was going to be a central tenet of how they solve the problem. I hear what you're saying about it. you can only use that trick so many times, but in fairness to Zack Snyder, in this case, Flash playing with time is one of his kind of central powers within the speed force. This is not something that was invented for this movie. It is actually used a lot in the comics. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, didn't, it didn't bother me as much other than the one thing we'll talk about later. But, and, and it was, I have to say the, I don't know what to call it, the super speed force, like where he's at that extra, I actually kind of liked the effect. It was kind of mm -hmm. cool. Like when he was like at the speed of light or beyond it, I actually like that effect better than sort of his regular speed force. So yeah, 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 I know, yeah. I did, it didn't bother me as much. I thought, you know, even though you kind of knew where, where we were headed and it took him a long time to get there, uh, I was fine with it. I actually did, that didn't mind. It, it still, I guess I was still caught up in how much better the overall scene was than the original one. I was like, all right, I, I get it. I get what you're doing. It's cool. I got yeah. cool. Now, so we got the epilogue. You know, I didn't care for it personally. I think I'd have been pretty happy to end the movie pretty close to the end of part six. I do empathize with Zack Snyder in the sense of, listen, like if you were in his shoes, I'd have emptied the gun too. Why the hell not? You know, you don't know what you might get a chance to do or not do. And if it's the last thing you get to do, throw it all out there. So I, I give him the pass from that standpoint. I did not find the content all that enlightening or all that entertaining, to be quite honest. Um, and we, you can pick your character, quite honestly. Like, I didn't think the Joker cameo was awesome or that essential. I didn't think Deathstroke's introduction, which we had already seen, but then they changed the dialogue, made it a little better. I didn't think that was all that interesting or essential. Mm -hmm. And the way the movie ultimately ends, I didn't really like, which was, I, I much rather, I would have taken this, the shots of them just standing side by side or some kind of wrap up with them going back to their lives or Superman opening his, his jacket. I'd have taken that over the Martian yeah. Manhunter, I'll be seeing you cameo which i really didn't care for although i guess we're led to believe that was supposed to be john stewart and instead it was the studio nixed it and so we had to use martin manander but i wouldn't have done that i would have I don't know, I would, I, first of all i would have been freaked out by something some this thing showing up and and, and him nonchalant <laughs> like who that who, who are like come on this is not nick fury showing up to Iron Man's house and you having that dialogue and not being freaked out and yet you have this alien if anything I'm going to get something to kill this thing what who are what is this you know it was just I, like where were you where were you so we got the confirmation in that scene Martian Manhunter really does suck and he's a <laughs> fair weather hero that's what that is yeah yeah man it's like I would have been, ups I don't know, man. I would, I, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. It's just like, it doesn't make sense for him to show up. If you wanted to make a dope impression, have him show up and fight along the Justice League yeah. during that time when you're fighting against Steppenwolf. Not when everything, oh, now you want to show up? For what? I mean, obviously, yeah, he's warning him that something is coming, but he should have been there. I would have been yeah, upset. It's funny you mention that because I, you know, the in the last episode of Justice League Unlimited, where they have that Thanagarian invasion, remember 
they bring back Martian Manhunter. He's that old man on the bridge, and they're like, get out of the way. And then all yeah. of a sudden, he turns into like a serpent. I'm like, that's yeah, bad. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. You know? exactly, exactly. I totally agree with you. But it had to poke fun because we've been making fun of this for, for months. And like in that scene, you got the confirmation where he's like, he's like, okay, nice to see you guys all fighting together. Now that you're a team, now I'm going <laughs> to join on. I'm like, that was your team. But now that you won, now I'm gonna join on. Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. I would have moments where you could have helped out. Exactly, exactly. And so that, it, it was just poorly. If this was the opportunity, I mean, again, you didn't have the studios stopping you from doing anything. Just put John Stewart in there, and that's it. Well, I he says been. they stopped him. He because... claims it because they had other plans for that character. He was off limits to him. That's what he's saying. Oh, okay. But my point is, if that was the case, don't do it at all. He's like, Martian Manhunter was the compromise. I'm like, why do there need to be a compromise? I don't think that scene, you know, so like I said, I empathize with the, hey, I only get one shot at this. I'm going to put everything on the screen. Yeah. I get that. But I don't think that ending added to what our overall experience was. But that yeah. being said, I don't think it takes away from this being pretty entertaining and pretty enjoyable. And like I said, I will go back and watch because unlike the other things on HBO Max, this is going to stay on there. So I do think this will do what we thought it was going to do because the buzz is good enough. The audience score is incredibly high. Yeah. Highest he's ever had in his career. Yeah. Yeah. Critical acclaim is highest he's ever had in his career. I think people are going to come and find out what the buzz is about. I think it's good enough that people will be interested to find out what everyone's talking about. Let me ask you this before we move on to the awards. Forget about if it will happen. Do you want it to happen? A Justice League 2. So I'm still in the camp it's going to happen and I think my my position got a boost this week from this. Um, I think overall the response would say we're headed. We was it if the chance was ten to twenty percent before, maybe we're at twenty. Look, I mean, we didn't talk about the pregnancy test. Um, we got to pretend like that doesn't exist. So I guess it's not Bruce Wayne's kid. It's actually. Clark's kid who yeah. then has no powers and becomes Batman, but he but Superman and Batman are like this. So I don't really know how that works either. Yeah. So the short answer to your question is I don't need it. And that part of the storyline scares the Jesus out of me because yeah. it just, as we discussed last week, it's just so much to take as far as believability. I will say what he teased about Justice League three. Given what we saw in this, I wish I could see some of that, which is the final showdown where they reunite kind of the Atlanteans, the Amazons, the Justice League, the military, and they go up against Darkseid and, and Apocalypse. Like the way he shot some of the bigger battles in this, I was like, I wish I could see that because that probably would look pretty cool. But I just don't trust the consistency of the storytelling to get me there. And like you said, with I can't get past this whole love triangle thing, which is really feels like it's going to would be the central part of this. And I just think it would bog it down. So I don't need it. I think there's a slightly better chance it happens after what after how this turned out. But I need it. I know where you stand on this. So. Oh, yeah, I'm not even going to get into it, I, I, but I'll say it anyway. I don't. I, we don't I don't want to see this anymore. I think it's done. I think there are better stories to tell. The fact of the matter is that there's a better story. There are better stories to tell. I don't need to see a new story that's totally out there from someone who wants to just tell his story, who wants to create a new thing and disregard and take pieces from classic stuff. I don't want to see it. I, I just, it just doesn't make, I, I don't want, again, I've said it before, you know, like comic books, people come in and write their stories, but this in terms of movie making takes years. Yeah. Yeah. And these guys are getting older. These guys, perhaps we want to move on. 
I just don't think we need it. Let's see if, because again, Walter Hamada is the one in charge, correct? The rumor was that this would operate separate from him. Now, I have no idea how you could pull that off, but that was the, the rumor that crossed was that there was talk that this might be happening and it would somehow be siloed away such that Walter Hamada would not be involved in the day to day management of this particular project. That's the rumor that's been put out. Okay. I mean, and that would make sense, but to make is it just sets back for me in my opinion in my personal opinion the dc universe takes uh several steps back in what it can't be because of this because if they're doing this then the new stuff that they're trying to do or attempting to do there's a lot of conflict there and I just don't know how it works. I mean, yeah, you can, you know, the Batman is going to be dope, and I, and I, I feel like the Batman is a, is a is a perfect jump off point for everything else, mm -hmm. right? Um, but with doing, if you're going to do the Justice League movie, second and, and third one, then do it on HBO Max. Do it there. Leave it there. I think that's the only place it could work. I mean, I think it would have to look kind of like this, you know, I and mean, yeah. hopefully not four hours, but I think R rated and I mean, with the tone you set, I don't think you could go back to PG or PG 13. You kind of have to carry through anti life equation, Superman going nuts. Like you'd have to make that pretty violent and I think yeah. pretty dark. Yeah. And ultimately, the final battle would be pretty dramatic. So, yeah, I don't think it belongs in a theater, to be quite honest. As much as I think some of the visuals would look cool. I think it would have to be HBO Max, but I, th I think it's a long shot, but I still think, I still think, I don't know, man, the buzz around this felt pretty high and the, the reviews and the feedback's been better than I might've expected. I liked it more than I expected. I think there's a chance. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I definitely liked it more than I would expect it to, but it's certainly something that I don't want to see continue. That's where I stand. That's where I stand. That's where I stand. That's where I stand. I hear you.